Hi, I'm Drew and welcome to Solar Life. Today it's rainy and cloudy outside and I thought I would focus this episode on what our off-grid solar house is like on a rainy, cloudy, snowy, or otherwise dark day. Essentially they're all the same. So as you know, you need the sun in order to charge up your batteries. And so essentially the more sun, the better, the less sun, less charge. Depending on the amount of cloud cover, we can get a small but effective charge going into our solar system, which is usually enough to maintain the load of the house, but not really enough to charge the batteries up. So if the cloud cover is light, we can hold out for several days before the batteries get depleted enough that the generator has to run. On a cloudy morning, the batteries have already held the house all night and essentially have depleted to about 80%. So if we get any less than six to eight kilowatts of energy into the solar system a day, then the batteries will slowly deplete themselves until the power drops below 46 volts and the generator will automatically start and recharge the batteries for a few hours. When the batteries are fully charged and floating the charge, they read about 56 volts. When the charge stops, they drop a little bit to about 52 volts, and then it drops from there uh, throughout the rest of the night. Eventually, uh, when the battery capacity gets down to 0%, we're at about 46 volts, and that's when the automatic generator start module will turn the generator on. So we try to conserve as much battery power as possible for as many days as we can to keep the generator from turning on. It uses propane to run and although we have over 900 liters of propane on reserve in the tanks, we would like to use as little of that as possible both to reduce the uh, emissions that are associated with that, but also to reduce our fuel charges and our refill uh, charges as well. Every time they come out, they uh, charge us a delivery fee. Ideally, I'd like to be able to go two winters without having to refill the tanks. And as we improve the efficiency of the house, it would be ideal to get even better closer to three years between uh, having to fill up the two tanks. I understand that if, you know, if we get closer to three years between fill-ups on two tanks, I could probably actually just drop to the one tank, but it's nice to have all the extra backup fuel if we need it. I keep a record of every time that the generator runs, and that way I'm recording how many times we use it every month. Uh, in an effort to try to track how much propane it actually uses. So since we went off grid in November, the propane generator ran five times in December. It ran an additional five times in January. It didn't run at all in February and didn't run in March either. It ran twice in April during a long rainy spell and it hasn't run yet in May. That's close to about 260 liters, I estimated. Uh, if you were to put that into uh, an amount that most people would understand, that's about 13 barbecue propane tanks worth of propane that we use just to charge up the batteries during uh, a long dark spell. So we're coming on a week straight of dark, rainy, cloudy kind of weather, and so I anticipate that we will likely have to run the generator at least once, if not maybe twice. We do our best to conserve energy every day, but on a cloudy day or a dark day, we essentially do all the same things that we usually do, with the exception that we do the opposite of what we would do on a sunny day when the energy is abundant. First, we let the laundry pile up and the dishes pile up, but we do it for the sake of the batteries. We do the dishes essentially once a day rather than, uh, you know, maybe twice a day. When we do the dishes, we use one half of the sink for washing, the other half of the sink for uh, rinsing, and then that way we cut down on the amount of use that we have on the pump and the amount of hot water that we have to uh, heat up as well. 
One thing that we also don't use on a cloudy day is the dishwasher. I installed the dishwasher probably about 10 years ago and it rarely ever gets used and it definitely never gets used on a cloudy day. The laundry will wait until the sun comes out or we have to run the generator because it produces so much power that it can carry the load of the house and charge the batteries at the same time. Here's a general list of what we try to do. We try to do the laundry, run the wood furnace and warm the house up, take a shower or a bath, charge tool batteries and other power hungry things like baking in the oven or using large power tools like the air compressor or table saws. Here's some everyday ways that we conserve energy in the house. The fridge and the freezer are by far the most energy demanding appliances in your average house. They run almost constantly and the more you open them, the more they run. We have an all fridge that doesn't have a freezer. In addition to the extra room, it uses less power than a normal fridge freezer combo. We also have a stand up freezer that we keep outside most of the year so that it runs a lot less and it actually runs almost never in the winter time. But now that it's spring, it runs a lot more often and the power that used to get used to run the furnace is now essentially being switched over and is running the freezers more often. To make the two units run super efficiently, I installed these simple temperature controllers that shut the compressor and the whole fridge off when they've reached their proper operating temperature, so when they've gotten cold enough. This takes all the guesswork out of how cold it is, what number should I set the dial to, how cold is this stuff, and because uh, you know, you don't want your stuff to freeze in the fridge and you don't want your stuff to thaw in the freezer, these temperature control units that I put in have a small probe that goes inside the fridge. It tells you exactly what the temperature is and you can set it to a fraction of a degree point. Your average fridge should be somewhere between four and five degrees Celsius and a freezer should be somewhere between minus 14 and minus 18 degrees, depending on your level of food preparation and uh, you know how much you like to obsess about how cold you want to keep your food. I measured the amount of kilowatt hours with the energy meter to see how the fridge worked with and without the controller and I saved over 30% of the daily energy usage on those two appliances that we have to run. So here's one of the ways that I know that they're working great. Um, it's very common to open the fridge door and the light is completely off. Now this would make most people think that the fridge was broken um, because not only is the light off, but you don't hear the compressor. There's absolutely nothing happening. Just silence while you sit there and choose your item in the dark. It's like an old fashioned ice box. So a lot of times the fridge will kick on while you're sitting there choosing your item in the dark. It's a really great reminder to choose your item before you open the door if you can, so that uh, you don't waste energy. The freezer operates the exact same way, except that we use it a lot less. That allows the freezer to stay at a much colder temperature and a lot of times we're able to open and close the door and take the item out without the freezer turning back on. Another way that we reduce energy usage in the house is by controlling how and when the furnace operates. The furnace in our house is an extremely demanding appliance. This winter, in an effort to reduce the draw that the powerful fan has on our batteries, we installed a duct fan booster to get the hot air to a cold part of our house. This started out as an experiment but it worked so well that I decided that I was going to install these duct boosters into all of the ductwork that I could find accessible in the lower part of the house. So essentially what happened through the experiment is that we were able to push the hot air through the house without having to use the furnace blower fan nearly as much. And because these smaller fans use a lot less power, the 
energy consumption from having to heat the house was reduced significantly. So I was able to tune the temperature control unit on the furnace so that it activated less but kept the box hotter and then we would just push the air through the house with these small duct fans. So the other thing that I did was I hooked them all up to the same type of temperature control unit that we used in the fridge and the freezer, except this time they were hooked into the heating side. And when the furnace kicked on and blew hot air through the house, the temperature probe inside of the ductwork would register the hot air. And when it got to a certain temperature, it would activate the switch, turn on all of the blower fans, and then they would continue to add, if not support, the heat throughout the rest of the house. And then the furnace blower fan would eventually shut off. Some of the fans, we put small controllers on them so that we could adjust the speed of the air moving through the fan um, for two reasons. One, so we could regulate the amount of heat coming into that room, but also some of the fans are noisy. So in our bedroom, we sometimes turn the fan down when we're going to sleep. So it's the end of day one, our first dark day, and the batteries are holding at around 84%, which is about where they were when we started the day. I think they were at 83%. We've made just over three kilowatts worth of power through the dark day. Uh, most of that I think we probably made in the morning when it was a little bit lighter. And so we've held our own today. We've you know, we've charged up just enough to hold the batteries at the same amount all day long. But as I mentioned before, we need about six to eight kilowatts to actually fully charge the batteries. So we're three to four kilowatts short of enough power to charge up the batteries. So at this point now we'll go through another night. We'll drain the batteries a little bit more. Tomorrow we'll start somewhere around 60% and then we'll go from there. We'll see what the next day is like. We're going to stay with this until either the sun comes back or we have to run the generator just so that you can see what a full uh, charging and depletion cycle looks like on the off-grid house. It's been 10 days since we started this episode and we had 100% full charge in the batteries. It's rained and been mostly cloudy for the past uh, week and a bit, and I wanted to review some of the charging and the power usage that we've had that led to the generator having to run last night. Generally in the winter time, we have about three to four dark days worth of power stored up in the batteries before we need to recharge the system using either the generator or solar power. Now that it's spring, we're getting more light every day, which is longer periods of light as well. So we're getting more power generation throughout the day. We're also heating a lot less, so we're using less power for heating. Um, so let's go over the energy usage over the past few days. So as you can see from this chart of our solar production and energy consumption over the week, that we started out at 100% on Sunday, and because it was dark and cloudy every day afterwards, we never produced enough power to charge the batteries up completely. Even though we made six kilowatts of power on a few days, it was not enough to charge the batteries up more than 10%, which means that this is likely that there was just enough power to, that day to carry the load of the house and to charge the batteries up a little bit. Monday and Tuesday were both dark and rainy days, so we produced very little power, and by Tuesday night I ran the generator for three hours to charge up the batteries to 50%. And this, folks, is off-grid's dirty little secret that when you run out of power, you have to burn fossil fuels to recharge your batteries. This is why I do everything I can to conserve power so that I run the generator as little as possible. So today is Wednesday, and... It was mostly cloudy all day with, uh, you know, some sunny breaks. We produced 5.5 kilowatts of power and the batteries are holding at 55%. Based on the weather forecast, I can assume that we will continue to be able to hold a pretty good charge 
and that uh, pretty soon we'll have a sunny day that'll give us a full recharge back up to 100 percent essentially uh, this is what it's like during a dark period we generally tend to lose power day after day after day until we eventually run out and then we either have to pray for a sunny day or we run out and we turn the generator on so i hope you enjoyed this episode about the dark days of solar production on solar life if you enjoyed this episode feel free to subscribe we've got more episodes on the way